From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Issue one, NSA shutdown. People say, how will we protect ourselves without these programs? What about using the Constitution? What about using judicial warrants? The Sonarif boy, the Boston bomber, they say, how will we look at his phone records? Get a warrant. Put his name on it. You can get a warrant. There's no reason in the world the guy had already bombed us. Do you think anybody was going to turn down a warrant? Earlier this week, Congress engaged in a heated showdown over the National Security Agency, otherwise known as the NSA. At contention were three NSA programs used to monitor terrorist communications. One involves maintaining records of phone numbers and times and duration of calls made over U.S. telephone network. Another involves roving wiretaps that cover disposable cell phones. The final involves so-called lone wolf surveillance that covers monitoring of terrorist suspects unaffiliated with established terrorist groups. But this time, the traditional battle lines, Democrat versus Republican, were replaced by public intramural Republican feuding. Just watch this heated face-off between Senator John McCain of Arizona and Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. People don't know the rules of the Senate. Maybe they should learn off Mr. The President, I request the remaining five minutes of time on the opposite side. Is there objection to the request of the senator from Kentucky? I object. Mr. In the end, a compromise won out. On Tuesday night, by a 67 to 32 margin, the U.S. Senate passed the USA Freedom Act that had already been passed by the House of Representatives. President Obama then signed it into law. The act reauthorizes many expired surveillance provisions of the Patriot Act, now defunct, but forces the NSA to seek warrants from telecommunications companies to access metadata. Then over the next few months, that metadata will be gradually transferred from NSA mainframes to phone companies. Still, some like Rand Paul are not satisfied. They insist the new law is overly authoritarian. Question, how big a political victory was this for Senator Rand Paul? Pat Buchanan. It's a terrific victory for Rand Paul for the reason, John, that it moves him back in, reestablishes him as Mr. Libertarian inside the Republican Party. It differentiates him from the other candidates, nine, of, nine others of whom have already been announced. I think, and it, and it also makes of a foil of John McCain, which is what Rand Paul really wants. I think so. I think it's a victory, but I do agree in terms of substance. I don't think the changes are all that great. All this data is available to the phone companies, and the NSA can call it in as soon as they want. Yeah, um, what Rand Paul is doing is catnip on the internet, and he certainly raised his profile and regenerated interest in his candidacies, uh, principally among young people and uh, libertarians. Uh, but it's such a pyrrhic victory. He got a 48-hour cessation in this program. Uh, the phone companies will now hold the data. In fact, they've been holding it already, so nothing really changes. And do you really feel comfortable with the civil liber liberties option being that the the Verizon guy gets to <coughs> know what you're doing. I mean, it, it was a lot of grandstanding about not very much. Yeah. Is this also a victory for Edward Snowden? Yes, to some degree. The problem for Edward Snowden, though, is it's not just these programs that he released. He released you know, tens of thousands of documents that ranged across a huge amount of issues, not just domestic surveillance, uh, surveillance against foreign targets, um, you know, and which has created major diplomatic problems for the United States. But I think Eleanor Ellen makes a very important point there that, you know, look, it, it, I would actually be more comfortable with the NSA having control over this, with all of the government bureaucracy that looks at that, that can bring people to account, that rather than a private company that has private interests and now has a lot of private information. Uh, you look at what Google and Facebook do, for example, uh, in terms of looking at their viewer base, looking at what people are looking up on a particular site and then sending ads to them. Private companies know a lot about Americans. And quite frankly, if we're going to be honest about this, uh, it should be a, a process of us saying, OK, we need to know what each person has. And it has to be a kind of level of equilibrium. Is this a defeat for Barack Obama? 
Well, in part it is, but uh, I think this has been an issue that has been brewing for quite a while. It's interesting, in uh, New York City we have something similar in a certain way, where we had a lot of stop and frisk actions on the part of the police. We had 675,000 stop and frisk events a couple of years ago. It's now down to like 27,000, just a complete drop. But now the crime rate is beginning to go up. Mm -hmm. So you haven't dealt with these issues in, in a serious the, way. The real well, division in society is John, sort of a, a communitarian outlook, which we got after 9-11, want the Patriot Act, we all want to be safer, we're willing to give up a, a few freedoms. And then after a while, time goes on and people say, look, they're violating the Fourth Amendment, they're doing this. The libertarian consciousness, if you will, rises against the communitarian, and yeah, that's what's yeah, happening Yeah, but the right USA now. Freedom Act, which the President signed this week, which is the compromise, got 338 votes in the House, and then finally almost, mm -hmm. what, 70 votes in the, in the Senate. So this is not a defeat for uh, President Obama. I mean, he has actually tried to bring some oversight to these programs, and he's continued a lot of the programs from the Bush era, trying to find that uncomfortable compromise. Governor Lincoln Chafee, who just declared himself a Democrat and is running for the presidency, says in the aftermath of this vote that Edward Snowden should be allowed to return to the U.S. without punishment. Is that a good idea, Tom? No, I don't think it's a good idea for the reasons I mentioned before. It's not just he leaked programs like this. The guy, he's also, you know, he's in, first he went to China, right, which we know this week with the OPM doing, they'd love to do the hacking. Then he went to Russia. I guarantee you the FSB, which is keeping him on a short leash, I guess, you know, and he's probably singing songs to them as well. This, this, look, he did, he leaked some things. He could have done a whistleblower defense mm -hmm. had he done a limited yeah. amount of stuff. I think this yeah. would have been perhaps he, he one. He started a huge debate he and did. a much needed debate in this right. country. But, and he's a hero to a lot of people. But he'd in released tens Friday, of thousands of New documents Times, which damaged got, our national security. Friday, New York Times, he's got almost the entire op-ed page. Oath and he broke so, the law and he ought to be prosecuted if he comes home yeah. to the full extent. He gave law. secret information, yeah, ultra it. secret information yeah, exactly. to Russia and China. He acted dishonorably. The uh, uh, I, former governor of Rhode Island bargain. is right. <laughs> Exit question. Does the USA Freedom Act strike a proper balance between freedom and security? Yes or no? Pat Buchanan. I think by and large it probably does. I agree. I think by and large. I agree. I agree. But Universal that private agreement. issue is important. That's yeah. what we don't like on the McLaughlin. <laughs> no, well, the private companies have well, too much. Issue two, going ballistic. In 2012, communist North Korea sent a long-range rocket into space. The North claimed that its launch was a space vehicle test. But the international community disagreed. It believes that the launch was actually testing North Korea's underdevelopment intercontinental ballistic missile system. Since then, tensions on the Korean Peninsula have been increasing. And get this, just last month, the North released footage of its leader, Kim Jong-un, supervising what it described as a successful ballistic missile launch from a North Korean submarine. While the U.S. and South Korean governments have not confirmed that claim, the North's increasing hostile behavior is raising new concerns. And the North's propaganda messaging is also picking up steam. This video was released by North Korean state television in April. It celebrates an attack on a South Korean island in 2010 and threatens to quote-unquote turn Seoul into a sea of flames by our strong and cruel artillery firepower. Seoul is the capital of South Korea. Facing these threats, the South Korean government is not sitting idle. On Wednesday, the South conducted its own ballistic missile test and claims it can target all of North Korea in the event of any conflict. Question, giving North Korea's overwhelming advantage over South Korea and ballistic missiles, should the U.S. further relax its restrictions on Seoul's missiles to restore the balance of power, Seoul being the capital of South Korea? Tom Broder. Uh, yeah, I think the United States should be. I mean, look, one of the good things from this is that South Korea is taking more ownership. It's a powerful economy now. For a long time, they have kind of allowed the United States to provide their security. But it is a sign that we need to be there. We need to be visible. Uh, we do need to have one of the problems that we have at the moment is because of sequester. We don't have the carrier fleets out. That sends a message to the North Koreans. 
President Obama, to his credit, in 2010 deployed a carrier after they started shelling an island, and that actually deterred them. But we need to send a message of uh, resolve. Ellen. The reason the world is not that exercised over North Korea's uh, nuclear capabilities is because they haven't had a delivery system. If this is true, and that's a huge <clears throat> if because nobody's confirming it and the administration seems kind of relaxed about it, I mean, then it would be a big problem. But right now they have uh, all the conventional weaponry to overtake South Korea any moment that they want, but they can't get a missile any further than, say, one of the far out Aleutian Islands. And so this is this bears watching, but I'm, I really, mm -hmm. I really think that this is in the realm sure. of uh, of exaggeration. Under current restrictions, the U.S. only allows the South Koreans, they're our allies, so to speak, to have missiles that range up to 500 miles and small warheads under 1,100 pounds. North Korea, by contrast, has ballistic missiles that can hit all of South Korea and Japan. Why does the Obama administration want to keep South Korea's ballistic missiles united uh, limited in capacity. 500 but. miles is enough to hit all of North Korea, John. Look, but you got to look at this. I'm a little more concerned than others. Kim Jong-un just took his General Dempsey, the head of all his armed forces, who fell asleep during a speech, put him up against a wall and executed him with an anti-aircraft gun. That he got his uncle and apparently threw his uncle to wild dogs, yeah. who was his chief advisor and yeah. mentor. And they've got, they do have ballistic missiles, land-based ballistic missiles, right. and I'm not sure they haven't married a nuclear weapon to that. Yeah. But I disagree with Tom. I would get, the, they, they, one of his problems is he's paranoid about the Americans. I would get our ground troops out of South Korea, rely on air and naval power. South Korea has twice the population of the North and 40 times the economy, and tell the South Koreans, you gotta start spending more than three or four I mean, percent it, for your own defense. He's a paranoid leader, but I'm sure he's got a bunker there that would protect right. him from any missile attack. I mean, <laughs> I just don't think more missiles are the answer to that conflict. Well, they're trying to do it to extend the range to, to send, uh, you know, to send a message that in the event of war, you have a big fuel capacity. You can you know, Why does the Obama administration want to keep South Korea's ballistic missiles limited in capacity? Well, I think they uh, consider the leadership of South Korea to be something other than the most responsible government you could want to have as an ally, to put it mildly. Who's the president of South Korea? The woman. Park. The woman. How old is she? The woman. I think 40s. How long has she had the job? 40s. She's, a, yes, again. she's the she's daughter fish. of yeah. uh, Chung Hee Park, she's, I believe. She's, 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 she's fine. fine. She's in her 40s, I she's, believe. She's, I she's fine. She's a tough she's customer. I think she's in her 60s. She's been <laughs> yeah. around a long time. But she's a, she is a tough customer, John. But, you know, I just think the, uh, with regard to, here's what we ought to do. We ought to tell the Chinese that we're go if you don't do something about their atomic weapons, we are getting out of this area, and you can deal with the Japanese and South Koreans who yeah. will build their own nuclear yeah. weapons right. to wake mm -hmm. these guys up. This kind of tit for tat, I mean, South Korea responded to this latest uh, uh, missile uh, demonstration, and I think the administration doesn't want the tit for tat to get out of hand, and that's been going on for some time. That is not new. What is the classic solution in diplomacy to prevent conflict between two neighboring hostile powers? Mort Zuckerman. Well, the classic solution is that there is a secret negotiation in which they each somehow or other uh, compromise enough so that both of them are reasonably comfortable. Well, this is going to be very difficult in this East situation. East and West Germany got together, whereas the Confederacy right. and the Union right. didn't get together right. until right. the Confederacy. Or, right. or else it's, <laughs> <mil> <laughs> <perfect> <laughs> or else it's <laughs> military parity, which right. you can't achieve with North Korea because they have this military. They have everybody in the Army, and they can overrun South Cor Korea very easily. As a question, should the U.S. help South Korea, our ally, so to speak, right? Not build so a missile speak. defense system, or should the U.S. ease restrictions on Seoul and let the South Koreans build up their missile arsenal? No, you don't want to build up the South Korean missile arsenal where it goes more than 500 miles and brings Japan in as a target and brings the China is in, in as a target. I do think you would tell the, tell the South Koreans, we're going to move our ground troops out of that front line and you fill those up and then you'll have access to the greatest weapons in the world 
in self-defense, and we will be offshore. I you don't want to encourage an arms race between yeah. South Korea and North Korea and Japan, you know, uh, God way, forbid. Uh, yeah. uh, but South Korea is not a so-called ally. They're a strong ally. The way I've described uh, Kim Jong-un, you know, the North Korean regime, is that it's like a child throwing toys, right? They want attention. But the problem is he has now nuclear weapons. And the reason I think you need ground troops is it's a physical representation of American power. And also, I actually tend to disagree with Pat. I think the South Koreans having those long-range missiles is actually to give the Chinese a kick. In the, is South you know, Korea our ally? You heard, Eleanor. Of course, yeah, we've got a yeah. security treaty. But they need treaty to spend more on defense. We've yes. got a 1954, I believe it is, mutual security treaty. They are a real ally. That's right. Have they ever been otherwise? No, they have not been since the, the United States took over South Korea and the Russians took over the North and since the war of 1950. Uh, this is looking way ahead, but there's a submarine, uh, sub submarine business involved in this. If the North gets... A, an atomic bomb on a submarine and then gets a way of refueling, maybe in Guam. Um, They're gonna, we're going to refuel that, it for that them? Would, <laughs> that would be trouble. Right they will, that's they what you're talking about. They could attack They'll Guam. They'll fake it out. Oh, well, listen, I tell you, if they got a nuclear okay, weapon on a submarine... Okay, they're on the way submarine. to the United States. What's that, what they really want to do? I tell them to Is turn, that inconceivable? I tell them to turn, turn around. around. I had that dream the other We send the Los Angeles class and the Sea Wolf and Virginia class out and sink their ships, but it's a risk. Issue three, Greece on the brink. It would be a disaster primarily for the Greek social economy, but it will also be the beginning of the end of the common currency project in Europe. Whatever some an analysts may be saying about firewalls, these firewalls won't last long. Once you put, infuse into people's minds, into investors' minds, the idea that uh, the Eurozone is not indivisible. It will be only a matter of time before the whole thing begins to unravel. The Eurozone was in crisis again this week. Greece faced a Friday deadline to access $8 billion in new bailout money from its creditors. Greece needs the money to support its struggling economy and for payments to existing creditors, like the International Monetary Fund. And there's a glitch. Now led by an avowed socialist government that's deeply opposed to so-called austerity spending reforms, Greece is reluctant to agree to creditor demands for major structural reforms and spending cuts. And note this, Greece still has $360 billion in sovereign debt. Still supported by France and Germany, Greece's creditors are playing hardball and saying that no money will be offered without reform. Here's how French President Francois Hollande explains their position. We will be saying the same thing. That is to say, we want Greece to remain in the Eurozone, but at the same time, we also want to find a lasting solution. Question. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew went to Europe last week to broker a grand bargain between the EU and Athens. Why is the Obama administration concerned about the Greek crisis? You want to hit that again? Well, let me tell you something. The Greek crisis is serious, not just because it's Greece, but because it says a great deal about the whole of the European financial markets, okay? And the, you have a situation today where there are, there's a lot of concern over the, uh, shall we say, the uh, even the United States' economy is very weak. So you, 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 there's a lot of concern about who's going to back this up. You've got to have a level of confidence and security that these things are not going to unravel because then it feeds on itself and we could face a real financial crisis. The fear is that Greece could be a Lehman Brothers of right. the coming financial crisis. And both, but the Europeans seem to be saying they're better prepared now for an exit by Greece than they were. They're playing a little tougher, John. By the end of June, Greece has got to come up with, what, $1.7 billion for the IMF. But ultimately, I think Europe has got to prepare itself for the fact that these southern economies, Greece and the others, just simply aren't going to live up to the standards of Germany and Finland and countries like that. And they probably should have a dual-tier Eurozone system, or they should be allowed to get out. Look, it may be uh, morally unsatisfying to look at the Greeks and say they live beyond their means, why should they be rewarded? Mm -hmm. But there's some economic truths here, and that is if, if Greece gets out of the EU, they're in worse shape and so is the EU. And so I think there's going to be a right. lot of this and dancing and you know playing chicken and game theory. And in the end, I think they're going to work this out, and they, they already came to a deal 
this weekend where they can package how much they owe and they can pay the end of June, which gives them access <laughs> to a bigger bailout Good package. <laughs> and the, the Greeks okay. have suffered. Their unemployment rate is 28 percent, for goodness uh, sakes. Me, uh, you don't want to bring them to their knees. Let me do a little research that I don't think you've done for yourself. Maybe you have. <laughs> but in uh, the Financial Times for Friday, May the 5th, Greece in the final hour, a plea for sanity. That's the title of the letter written by Professor Joseph Stiglitz, Columbia University Nobel Prize winner. He says, how Greece is treated will send a message to all its Eurozone partners. Like the Marshall Plan, let it be one of hope, mm -hmm. right. not despair. He's joined here by an array of uh, other worthies. Uh, who are teachers, but uh, yeah. did I give you enough background yeah. on Look, him? John, I think the issue here is though that, you know, Greece has for a long time lived beyond its means. It still mm -hmm. is. There is a delusion at the heart of this, which, you know, the, the, the tax collection is awful, a lot of corruption, uh, massive overspending, massively inefficient right. public sector. That needs to be reformed. Syriza, which was elected, the socialist government, is living in delusion, as socialists tend to do, about the reality of that. But at the same time, again, the imp why Syriza is having some success playing hardball is that, you know, if they, you know, the Euro they, European Union know if they and, go out, they've big offered, problems for the they've project. They've offered a compromise with well, pension but, reform. No, but, yeah, but, you know, the pension's is a social contract. You can't pull the rug out from people you know, when the whole country is imploded. There's a reason for a bankruptcy. All right. There's a reason for a bankruptcy court that some people are bankrupt. And frankly, Greece owes, its debt is twice the size of the economy. Right. They can't make it, so you all got to look at it realistically. Yeah. The debtors yeah. or the creditors are not going to be paid right. back. Haircut. All right, see, see if this makes you think any differently. This is again, uh, this is a great, again, uh, Stiglitz. Stiglitz. Clearly revised, a large, uh, let's see, clearly revised longer term agreement with the creditor institutions is necessary. Otherwise, default is inevitable, imposing great risks on the economies of Europe and the world, that's and even for the European that's project. That's exactly what he's saying. That the, Euro tone was, the Eurozone was supposed to strengthen. That's exactly correct. Look, the creditors are going to take a big bad haircut if you if they're going to stay in the European uh, the eurozone. That's all there is to it. If Greece exits the eurozone, will Russia and China extend an economic lifeline to Athens? No, they'll go back to the drachma. Uh, they're going to stay in the eurozone. I think they'll probably stay in because you know Syriza is playing hardball and the Germans don't want them out. The EU, EU will fail. They will stay in the eurozone if there's any possible way of doing it. The right. alternatives are so much worse than that. But the, the, there are only bad choices here. This is what I call the evil of two lessers. There's just nothing here that's going to help either side, but somebody's going to have to face up to the difficult problem because if you don't resolve it, then you have another major league problem that is going to be much worse than what we're talking okay, about. Okay, Greece stays on. Issue four, Jeb grabs the third rail. For people that are about ready to be, be beneficiaries of, of their supplemental retirement. I don't think we change that. But we need to look over the horizon and begin to phase in over an extended period of time going from 65 to 68 or 70. And that by itself will help sustain the retirement system for anybody under the age of 40. That was Jeb Bush speaking last week to CBS News now retired Bob Schieffer. And Jeb gave Bob a major final story asserting that were he to become president, he'd likely engage in major reforms of America's social security system. Long the third rail of American politics, social security reform has flummoxed many presidents. George W. Bush pursued an effort to transfer part of the social security system into optional private investment accounts. He failed. President Obama also proposed reforms to social security but backed away after facing Democratic pressure. And that speaks to a broader point. Whoever the Democratic nominee for president turns out to be in 2016, she or he will face heavy pressure from the Democratic base, which does not favor any change to Social Security. Here's how Bernie Sanders, himself a Democratic candidate for president, encapsulates that view. Do we stand with them and expand Social Security or do we listen to those on Wall Street and corporate America who want to cut Social Security benefits and in some cases want to privatize Social Security? Is Social Security likely to be a major issue in the presidential election? I ask you, uh, Eleanor. Yes, in the sense that uh, watching uh, Jeb Bush 
proposed raising the age from 65 to 67 or 8 or 70. First of all, it's already been raised to 67, and he really reveals himself as a rich person who has no idea what this program means to many people in this country. So I don't think he, that he has a winning message. Or, or, and uh, Governor Christie, New Jersey Governor Christie, has already come out on a uh, Social Security a platform of trimming. And the Democrats are going to run on expanding and strengthening it. And in an age of income inequality, I think uh, the Democratic message is going to be a lot more appealing uh, than this allocation. John right now al is 66. Allocation. So I don't know. Bush is not right on it. And it is moving up. And this is a serious issue if you want to get the budget under control. But I'll tell you this, you start talking about the cost of living increase or raising taxes on Social Security or raising the age, you'll get a nice editorials in the number of newspapers and you will be slaughtered, I think, in a race with a Democratic nominee in November. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Because it has become increasingly difficult for individuals to build their own security single-handed government must now step in and help them lay the foundation stones. Just as government in the past has helped lay the foundation of business and industry. That we was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, speaking two years before the first monthly Social Security check was issued in 1940. In the 1930s and 1940s, Social Security was controversial, but since then, Social Security has become a staple of American retirement, something that voters expect to receive and believe they're entitled to. Yet today's Social Security system is on thin ice. According to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, without reform, both the Disability Insurance Trust Fund and the Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund will go bankrupt by 2032. Exit question, multiple choice quiz. What's the best way to make Social Security solvent? A, de delay retirement, B, raise FICA taxes, C, root out fraud and waste, D, reduce benefits, either by means testing or across the board, E, all of the above. I think all of the above, because if my generation wants to have access to Social Security, we better reform it. 2033, the trust fund runs out. There will be income transfers to pay for that, but it just increases that federal debt. Interest rates just buries the economy in debt Mark, for my uh, generation. Ten, sec ten seconds. Look, I think we're... Anything that's going to make this uh, system uh, uh, solvent is necessary. You just can't sit here and let it explode because right. it's yeah. going to be a national tragedy and everybody's right. going to have to pay the price well, in one form raising or another. The, raising the cap uh, so that people at the higher income levels continue to pay into the system is the most obvious thing to do. With I already quickly. do, Eleanor. Out of time. Bye-bye. <laughs>